I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid. The world has a hundred questions I can play with. So I'll open my arms and eyes and wonder every day till the day I die. No one really knows why gravity exists. So we're going to start our journey today with a classic study from 1985 by a guy named Mark Allen. So here's what he did. He brought a bunch of college students from, I believe, Ohio State University at the time, and he asked them two questions about a bunch of different traits. He asked one, to what extent are you cooperative, kind, trustworthy, all these different things. The second question he asked for these different traits is to what extent is the average college student cooperative, intelligent, etc., those kinds of things. And what he found is that for the positive traits, like being intelligent, attractive, or reliable, people tended to think that they were better than average. In other words, those traits were more characteristic of them than the average person. But for the undesirable traits, people thought that those things were less characteristic of them than the average person. In other words, they thought they were less incompetent, less dishonest, less rude than the average person. And I want you to think about that for a second. Let's take this to the extreme case where we sampled every single person on the planet and we still see this effect, that everyone thinks that they're more intelligent, they're more attractive than the average person. Okay, so that doesn't actually make sense because theoretically, 50% of people should be more intelligent, let's say, than the average person, and 50% should be less so. So what this is demonstrating is that in aggregate, people are overconfident and believe that they're, you know, higher on these positive traits than they actually are. Okay, so I haven't talked about communication yet, but the reason I wanted to start here is because this is a really foundational study on overconfidence, and it applies to a lot of things. So they measured a lot of traits in this study, but people are overconfident in a lot of things, a lot of socially desirable things in particular, and we're gonna apply that to communication. So let's move forward to 2005. As you may remember, some of you, um, in 2005, we were barely just discovering the capabilities of computers and electronic communication. So what these researchers were interested in is, can people tell how well they're communicating over email? And what they'll find, as it says here on the slide, is that people are generally overconfident about how well communication goes over email. Okay, so here's what they did. They brought pairs of undergraduate students into the lab, and for one of those students, who was designated to be the communicator, they gave them a bunch of statements that were later labeled as sarcastic or serious. So like a sarcastic statement might be, oh yeah, because a meal isn't complete without kale and everything. And a serious statement would be, balanced diets with vegetables like kale are essential for good health. Okay, so they have 20 statements like this. So the communicator was then instructed to select 10 out of 20 of these statements to show to the listener, to send to them via an email. And they were instructed to select the 10 that they thought would be the easiest to identify as being sarcastic or serious. And then they asked them, how many out of these 10 statements do you think your partner will identify correctly? So these communicators predicted that they'd be able to get 78% of those statements correct. You know, eight out of 10 maybe identified correctly as sarcastic or serious. But in reality, their, uh, their partners were only able to get 56% of them correct. And if you think about it, there's actually only two options here, right? Sarcastic or serious. So at 56%, these listeners are actually barely performing better than chance. Okay, so what's going on here, right? Um, the title of this paper is actually called Egocentrism Over Email. And egocentrism is the idea that you are egocentric about what you think and you project it onto other people. So for the communicators, they're thinking, oh, it's so obvious. This is obviously a sarcastic statement, as I just learned five seconds ago. So clearly my listener will understand that too. And they replicated that finding that I just told you about, overestimating the probability that their listener would understand their statement in a variety of contexts. So not just email or text, but also in voice-only contexts or face-to-face -face contacts. And they found that the effect is a little bit weaker, but it's still there. And I think this idea of egocentrism is really what underlies a lot of miscommunication or problems in communication, or just difficulties, let's say. Which is that when you're the speaker, or when you're the communicator, what's in your mind is so crystal clear, and you don't appreciate that it's not obvious to other people. 
So yes, that is the first study, egocentrism over email. But again, this I think is a, a broader idea that applies to a lot of things in communication. OK, let's fast forward all the way to 2024. This paper is literally hot off the presses. It was published earlier this year. And it basically shows overconfidence in detecting listening. Specifically, that communicators are overly enthusiastic and positive about how often their listeners are listening to them. OK, so I'm not sure. Maybe if I play this. All right, let's imagine that I gave this whole talk with this nice commercial or a series of commercials playing behind me. And I told you that the more commercials you could remember, the more I would pay you for your participation well, in the audience. I know that's enough of that. Anyways, that's exactly what these researchers did. They brought pairs of participants into the lab, one of whom was watching a series of commercials in the background the entire time, and one of whom who was, was just talking to them. So they were supposed to be having a conversation, um, a get-to-know-you conversation to see whether they could be good roommates. Oh boy. OK, so there are three conditions for the listeners. So in the first condition, attentive listening, the listeners were just instructed to completely ignore the commercial, engage in the conversation normally, you know, get to know your partner, all that, listen well, just be a normal person, basically. Okay, feigned listening. These people were instructed to uh, actually pay attention to the commercials, and remember, they're getting paid more, the more they can pay attention to the commercials, but actually, like, they still wanted them to pretend to their partner that they were listening. So, you know, they're still trying to nod, like, look engaged, all this. Um, and the partner is just talking to them the whole time. Okay, then there's the completely distracted condition where they tell them, again, you're gonna be paid more for how many commercials you remember, um, and don't even try to pretend that you're listening. <laughs> okay, so first of all, they ask these listeners, right, the ones who receive this experimental manipulation, uh, how well do you think your partner is going to think that you are paying attention? Um, this is just on a one to seven scale. So in the attentive listening condition, People are thinking, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm a good person. I'll be a 5.32 out of seven. In the feigned listening conditions, remember these are people who are pretending that they're listening. They thought that they're gonna do a pretty good job and be able to fool their partners into thinking they're listening. And the completely distracted people were like, oh, I'll, I'll be okay, but I think I'll be a little bit worse than these people who are actually listening. Okay, so what did the communicators think? I guess I spoiled it already, but um, they could not tell at all. Um, they basically thought across all of these conditions that their listeners were paying attention to them. Um, these, none of these bars are different from each other, and you'll notice that even, even in this very distracted condition, they're still thinking that their listeners are there paying attention to them, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. So not only could they not tell when their listeners were distracted but trying to pay attention, they couldn't even tell when the listeners were completely distracted and not thinking at all. So that's pretty unfortunate for speakers, especially those giving presentations. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, this manipulation did actually work. So it wasn't that you know they gave the instructions and the listeners were like, oh, I'm going to be a good person and then pay attention. Anyways, no, like they were actually you know remembering much more commercials when they were trying to remember the commercials. Okay, so what does this tell us? It tells us that communicators are overly optimistic about how often their listeners are paying attention to them. Even when, you know, it's very natural for someone to be talking to you and your mind wanders thinking. Test. Okay, okay. Your mind wanders, you're thinking about other things. That's very natural, it happens all the time. Um, but the, the communicators don't seem to recognize this. And they actually did another version of this experiment where they had people just watch the videos of the listeners listening. And they were like, okay, this person was either paying attention, not paying attention, or trying to pay attention. And those observers couldn't tell the difference either. So it's not just that the speakers were distracted and in their own head. It's just that it's, it's very hard to pick up on when someone is listening to you. And regardless of the condition of the listener, the speakers were basically 80% of the time thinking that, or sorry, the observers were thinking 80% of the time that the listeners were in the attentive listening condition. So basically, they were just you know happy to default to assuming that the communication was going well, when in reality, they were just watching commercials. So that's all very unfortunate. But that's OK, because now we know. All right, um, the fourth and final study I'm going to tell you about is one that I actually ran with my other research advisor, Juliana Schroeder. And I ran this at UC Berkeley last year. 
Um, and I think the contribution of our study is to focus a little bit more on the listener perspective, because so far we've been talking a little bit about you know, communicators thinking it's going better than it actually is. So what we did is, of course, we brought pairs of participants into the lab, because we always need pairs for communication. So we had one of them designated as a communicator and one designated as a listener. So we had the communicator watch a video, a 10-minute YouTube video on motivation, so they could learn how to motivate themselves and others at work. Afterwards, the listener came into the lab, and the communicator was instructed to explain what they had just learned to the listener. And after the conversation, both of them tried to predict how well the other person understood the video, um, as well as how well the communicator thought they were articulating their point or speaking, basically. And then afterwards, they took a test, kind of testing their knowledge of the video, the original video that the communicator had watched, and they were both paid just a little bit more money depending on how many questions the listener got correct. And they knew that before the conversation. So, you know, we want them to do a good job communicating, as best a job as they possibly can. Okay, so in general, we find that the listeners also think things are going better than they actually are. So first of all, uh, this is the articulation measure. So basically, this is how well does the communicator think they are articulating their point. So these numbers are a little hard to see, but Basically, um, the listeners think that the communicator is articulating at a 5.5 out of 7, and that's a lot better than the communicators themselves report speaking. So in other words, it's really obvious to the speaker you know, the mistakes they're making, things that they left out and maybe didn't articulate as well, but the listener kind of just assumes that things are going pretty well. Okay, and then these bars on the right are some understanding measures. So this middle set of bars is their test scores. They actually generally did pretty well. Um, these are UC Berkeley students, so you know they know their stuff. But remember, a perfect score is 10 here. So in reality, the communicators got about eight out of 10 questions correct. But the listeners thought they were like pretty much perfect. They were like, oh, my communicator was so good. They probably got 9.3 out of 10 questions correct. Um, and we see a similar pattern on the self-reported understanding measure. So again, that's communicators just kind of subjectively saying, I feel like I understood that pretty well. Um, but the listeners think that they think that they understood very, very well. All right, so all together, this is basically telling us that from the listener's perspective, they're assuming that things are going really well, especially when they're just thinking about the communicator. They think the communicator knows more than they do and that they're articulating as well as they possibly could have. Okay, so we went through a couple decades of psychology research today. So I'm just gonna try to sum it up right here. So first, people are often overconfident. They think they're better than others. They think they're better than average, let's say, especially on positive traits. We can apply this to, communi to communication. So that communicators think that their communication is more easily understood than it actually was. So remember over email, they thought that their listeners would understand something 80% of the time when they actually were like better, barely better than a coin flip. All right, third, we found that communicators might not be able to tell whether listeners are listening, and they kind of just default to thinking that the listeners are listening, even when they might be completely or semi-distracted. And then finally, we also have that the listener thinks that the communicator communicated better than they have and maybe knows a little bit more than they have. Okay, so all together, what does this tell us? And is this bad? And why does this matter? Well, there's a lot of miscalculations here. But the basic idea is that communicating is harder than we think, and it might not be going as well as we think. So this might lead us to miss opportunities to ask follow-up questions or to kind of smooth over things that could have gone better. Because we kind of just assume things are going well. It's a natural tendency. But in reality, it's really important to kind of zero in on those situations where there might be miscommunication or things might not be going well. So if you only remember one thing from today, I hope it's that communicating is harder than you think it is. As a reminder, communication and socializing is part of what makes our species so fantastic. So communication is a great tool, but it is also one that is hard to use. And that's all I have, I think. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll take any questions. use a social contract notion, you use networking. Mm -hmm. And basically, everybody outside of your network is a target. 
Okay, you don't really talk about dishonesty there. You're always looking for agendas and this, this kind of thing. What does this person gain if I understand what they're saying, the way they're saying it, and so on? It, it seems pretty different. Um, in an Eastern culture, you mean? Pardon? Like, compared to an Eastern culture? Uh, yeah, at least what I, what I have to deal with. So so you're, you're question. Question. Oh, yeah. Question. Um, I think the question, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, was that um, a lot of this and maybe conversations in general feels very specific to like Western culture, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the mechanisms I mentioned for these miscalibration is egocentrism, which is the idea that we kind of just think what we, yeah, we, we think what we have in our own minds and we project it onto everyone else, right? Which is kind of like maybe responsible for pulling up like, I think that they'll understand me because I understand it. Um, so I don't think that's been directly replicated in Eastern cultures, but there's reason to believe, like you're suggesting, I think that is less true in Eastern cultures um, because there's like a, another stream of research on like individualism and collectivism, which is basically that Western cultures are more individualistic and then Eastern cultures are more collectivistic, which basically just means that they think more about other people's perspectives in their daily life. So it could be that these miscalibrations um, are like less so in Eastern cultures where you're just like defaulting more into thinking about other perspectives. Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. um, I, have any of these tests been whether it was a man talking or a woman talking, a man talking to a woman, a woman talking to a man, has any of it been divided up into which sex the speaker or the listener is? Mm -hmm. um, Oh yeah, sorry. So the question was about uh, gender differences with these tests. So, um, like, have these tests been repeated or just looked at among men and women? So, that could be looked at in the data. I don't think there's been a specific paper published on overconfidence and gender in communication. There are papers suggesting that men may be more overconfident in general than women. Um, Maybe. <laughs> um, I'll note that my advisor, Don, does not believe in those gender differences, but those claims exist in the literature also. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, now that you brought up the uh, issue of communication, um, is there a separate um, like um, discussion or research on you know overconfidence when someone has a mental condition? For example, you know, people with autism, you know, like a day tend to be easily distracted or someone with OCD. Could you, you know, like, um, you know, like elaborate on what particular, you know, like a concerns or challenges when you bring up certain groups of individuals who have mental, you know, like a challenges? Yeah, so the question was about, um, how this research does or doesn't apply to those with mental challenges like autism. So actually the interesting thing about autism is the difficulty in perspective taking. So I would expect these effects to generalize and maybe even grow uh, among those populations, um, at least on the communicator side where there, the tendency is to be egocentric. Um, I'm not sure if it would necessarily, I don't have a strong hypothesis about uh, how that would interact with like, the listening finding, for example. Um, maybe they would also just assume, but uh, yeah, I'm not totally sure about that one. I mean, the, the, the thing is, like, you know, if I were to do a follow-up, one of the issues, you know, like for people with autism is that mm -hmm. they may think that they are listening to you, but um, the communicator would think that he's doing something else. They think that, you know, um, they're distracted, but in reality, those mm -hmm. individuals are actually listening to you even more than what they imagine, what they perceive it is. So that could be an interesting um, angle to look into when you deal with you know, like uh, individuals with you know autism or you know, like um, ADHD or you know like a certain other mental disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So just to repeat the thought was that uh, people with autism or ADHD might might be listening, but actually like physically look like they're not listening. So they might see like an opposite effect of what we saw in the third study. Um, which is definitely possible. So the effects I showed you were like mean level differences and we didn't actually, well, they didn't, I don't think report like what proportion of people or pairs were overestimating versus underestimating. So it's very, very possible that there are individual differences in some people, um, for example, those with ADHD are similar, um, appearing that they like 
like having the reverse effect, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, on the mismatch with how well your audience is listening, mm -hmm. do you know what the audience size was, and did they vary the size, and was there any trend in the size? In a, in trend lines in terms of related to the size of the audience? Yeah, so those were all one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations, so just pairs of participants. So it would only be like, I'm talking to you and, and nobody else kind of situation. Does it <coughs> reflect upon the topics of the discussion? I mean, if I was talking to somebody who doesn't believe in my political beliefs, I would assume that I'm communicating, but probably I'm not. <laughs> uh, yeah, the question was about whether this could be moderated by the discussion topic. So for political beliefs, you might, uh, if you're talking to someone on the opposing side, you might assume you're communicating with that. So you actually suggested that these results would be consistent. I actually see an argument for going the other way, where you're inclined, you're biased to think that they're not going to listen to you, um, but they actually are. So that, that could definitely happen. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my advisor who's not Don Juliana, she has some work showing that um, conversations with people on the opposite side actually usually go better than you think they will. So maybe maybe that's like evidence towards kind of assuming that they won't listen, but they actually will in a specific context where you know that they're like on the opposite side. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of studies like this in medicine where you talk to the patient and then you read back and figure out if they heard what you're saying mm -hmm. and you find you they had no idea what you were <laughs> Are there any ways to make it better? Yeah. Um, I, I asked the person, did you understand? And they go, yeah, and you, it doesn't help with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the question was, uh, this, there's like been similar studies and maybe anecdotes from like doctors and patients where it's like obvious that the patient like seems to be understanding but they actually don't. Also, let me know if we need to move on. But, um, and then the question is, are there any solutions? So, okay, so one interesting thing in that specific scenario for doctor and patient is there's actually a status difference between doctor and patient. So you might infer it's like more the doctor's responsibility to be like checking in and being like, are you sure you're understanding? Like, let me make sure you got it, like blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think on the communicator side, it's really just about like checking in more often, like trying to do more of the perspective taking, like okay, this patient has like no idea of like any medical terms, like this might be the first time they're hearing about any of this. Um, so really just trying to break it down. Like a lot of the same exercises that we do in our science envoy workshops, we're like trying to understand the audience. Um, and then on the listener side, like it is tough when there's a status difference, like in that example, but I mean, just try to show more like active listening, like asking questions, like nod, like uh, just just be expressive, I guess, if you want them to understand where you are. Um, yeah, I mean, I also guess that sometimes people just don't want to say that they're not understanding, especially if there's like a status difference. But if you're if the goal is information transfer, then just be humble and be okay with letting them know you don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes people are talking, one person is talking to another person, and the other person really has no interest in listening, mm -hmm. but they need to listen. Uh -huh. How do you address that? <laughs> Um, okay, so the question was, if the listener has no interest in listening, but they need to listen, how do you address that? Um, that is a great question. I feel like research has often shown that it's hard to just give people facts and be like, hey, here's why it's important. So that might not work. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, if, if we just knew how to convince people to listen to us, like everything would be so easy. Um, give them a massive test at the end of the year. Yeah, give them a test. Could be on the final <laughs> yeah, well, in, uh, in experiments, you could just give them an incentivized test where you give them a bonus for performing well, and that solves the problem. Um, I, yeah, I mean, in real life, like, I think you just have to do your best with being like, this is why this is important for you, and then. It's also good to say, like, this is why it's important for you specifically, like, compared to other people. Um, there's also a lot of research on, like, social norms and social pressure. So if you're trying to convince people, like, oh, like, it's important for you to understand why turning off your shower to save water is good, you can be like, and your neighbors are, like, really good about turning off their water and saving water. So you're, like, the worst neighbor on the block. Um, there's actually an experiment exactly like that. They would send letters to everyone on the street, and they're like, 
you're in like the top, bottom, or middle of, of water usage or something. It's just supposed to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, does the research in your field typically just involve a dyad face to face? I'm wondering, uh, the reason I ask is I'm thinking about the biases of the communication medium, mm -hmm. like text, for example, is mm -hmm. very different from speech. Yeah. Right? So the question was about uh, how this generalizes different media of communication. Um, so the first study I talked about, the one with the like sarcastic serious comments, they actually did that in uh, like all, well not all, but like some different combinations. So there's the text only, which is the one I mostly talked about. They also did it with like a voice only. So I think they brought people into the lab and like put up a divider between them. And then there's like a normal conversation condition. So they got the same uh, directional effect that people like think that they'll understand better than they do, but it was like weaker in the other cases. So like the face-to-face -face communication, like you're saying, um, there's like obviously a lot more cues, right? Like you have the visuals, you have the auditory, like the, the, t the pitch of the voice and stuff. Um, so you, you can get more information, which like helps some of the miscalibrations. Um, but also some research has shown that for like conflict conversations, like on political topics, people like go towards the, the less rich media, like texting, but those conversations are actually worse. So that's something fun too. All right, thank you guys so much. I'm happy to chat after as well. Even though the, the problem of self-confidence, human problem, seems so profound, I gotta think that being aware of the problem might be so, take a tiny step toward the solution. I'm not overconfident of that fact. <laughs> I've got to think there's hope. All right, our next speaker is Josh Tong. He's a researcher and PhD candidate in the physics department at Stanford. His current research involves dark matter. But Josh's broad background, he earned his undergrad degree in physics and mathematics at NYU, allowed him to do research on quantum computation, laser interactions with atoms, and on tonight's subject, growth and form. Please welcome physicist and Wonderfest Science Envoy, Josh Tong. Hello, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight and supporting Wonderfest. Thanks, Sophia, for your wonderful talk. And uh, thanks, Tucker, for your introduction. Um, today I'll be talking about growth and form. Where are you headed in life? Really, I, I'd like if you think about it just for a second and kind of picture where you'd like to be going, who you'd like to be with. Do you picture traveling, a successful career, there are some kids in the audience who have a lot more <laughs> to experience compared to the wiser of you in the audience. <laughs> so, if you're like me, you're not so sure exactly where you'll be going, where you'll end up, but I'm hoping that the physics of growth can help you to get where you want to be. So how do you grow? First of all, you have to look in the mirror, measure yourself up, which can be kind of difficult and daunting, but okay, um, first I'll figure out, uh, maybe I'll measure how tall I am. So I take a measuring tape and uh, make a mark on the wall and measure me up. And uh, I'm not that tall, so maybe I don't like that measurement very much. Uh, okay, uh, I'll uh, come up with a different kind of measurement. Not something physical, maybe like measure a hundred things that you can memorize. And you write down a hundred words on a card, a hundred words on a hundred cards. You come up with a test to measure how good you are at memorizing a hundred things and you work at this every day, you use your flashcards, 
you use sticky notes, you try your absolute best, and the test comes, and uh, what do you know? You just forget everything. <laughs> you get, you just can't remember a thing. Uh, so I, I guess we think of some more creative things to measure about ourselves that maybe we, we can stand out. Um, you imagine thinking of a thousand things you can measure, an uncountable amount of things you can measure about yourself, and imagine that that thing you measure as an arrow pointing out from a point, and then the distance that arrow reaches out is like how good you are at that measurement. And then you stick all of those arrows together, you get a shape. This bean looking thing, that's, that's me. So that's how good I am, where it juts out, and uh, kind of cave where I have some growing to do. So uh, what's, the, what's the use of, of like looking at yourself as a, as a two-dimensional shape on a, on a screen? So I think that when you draw yourself like this, you look at yourself from this perspective, you can look at other shapes and wonder what kind of shapes can you grow into from where you are now. So uh, the needle, for example, could be represented uh, like a scientist, someone that's super specialized, is good at one thing, but not very broad. The heart is like someone that's really caring, that's a caretaker, and really loving. The sphere is someone that's well-rounded, really jack of all trades. The star is like a superstar, a performer, a musician, an artist, and uh, money bag, they, they, they have a large bank account. <laughs> Okay, so what you want to do is, okay, which of these shapes are you interested in growing into? How you grow is actually continuum mechanics. So this shape, the way you get from one shape to another is a process of growth that goes through one shape being deformed under stress and load and pressures and that shape deforms into another one, and exactly the sum of all those pressures put together changes the one shape, which is us in this, in this metaphor, into our other shape, which is our goal, the place we're trying to get to, so that we can get to where we want to be. And here the axes that we're drawn are like our measurements that we've set up to measure our shape, and then this whole trajectory, this path line, is the work we've done the work we put in, all the effort we, we did to get to where we want to be. Something I want to point out here now is that you're not growing in an isolated environment. Okay, The environment that you grow in, that's crucial. So I don't know if we can see this very well. This is a table that's the number of doctorate recipients detailed by doctorate, citizenship, ethnicity, and race in 2022. And it turns out that zero in either of my fields in particle physics or theoretical physics look like me. Zero in all of the hundreds of PhD students that graduated in 2022 were black. And it's not because people like me don't like particle physics or that they don't like theoretical physics. I mean, the particles are what make us up. It's how stars are born. It's how galaxies are seeded. It's, it, it's exciting. It's not because we don't want to. It's because the environment that you have to go through to get where you want to be is more difficult, depending on what you look like. And so my point is here is that the environment is shaping people like a sculptor. It's, it's every day you, you see, you see it's forming you. It's like putting you into something you can and can't be. But the, the point is that it doesn't affect me, it also affects you. 
the, the same values that shape what I look like or what's possible for me are the same values that are imprinted upon you and what you think is possible and what, think, what you think you can do for yourself. The question is, what are the values of all of these shapes? The, the scientist and the, the caretaker and the, the all-rounder and the star and the business person. Um, this part of the growth process is where you take in your environment, you see the bigger picture, you, you, you want to take in what you value and at the same time, recognize what the environment around you, what the other people, what your surroundings value, and take it in. What, what do you want? What can you keep? And recognize what you don't value, what people, what the environment doesn't, and you can choose to leave that behind. One would think if you're talking about value, what's maybe I just want to grow and grow bigger and bigger and keep growing. From the perspective of the elephant, what does it care about the mightiest ant that gets in its way? It's going to keep going and it's not going to, it's not going to care. It will continue to live its life. To be big, it's great. It doesn't have to worry about lions. It doesn't have to worry about reaching the tallest leaves in the branches. Right, but from continuum mechanics, from a physics standpoint, there's only so much that, that creatures can grow, that a physical animal is only so large that the elephant can get. Like sand growing on a sand pile, for example. You keep growing, or like, like snow on a mountain, the snow keeps coming, and the snow keeps coming and building up eventually, there has to be an avalanche where there's a critical point where there's only so large you can grow. On the flip side, let's look at it from the ants' perspective. The ants, in their in their small world, don't they, they don't care about what the elephant's doing. <laughs> they they they're they're fast, they're nimble, they're quick. Uh, and the elephant is in a different dimension compared to them. They, they don't even recognize that the elephant is there. And the point is that the, uh, if the ants got together, if all the mass of all the ants came together and there was a queen ant who directed everything, uh, all of their emotions, the, the sum of all the ants' efforts could overcome the biggest obstacle, could overcome an elephant if they wanted to. And somehow we know that, that that communicating between individuals is really hard, and the bonds that link individual ants are way weaker than the bonds inside of a single animal, right? I don't know to bring that point home closer to to um, keep going along these lines, like. What if you think of yourself as a queen ant in control of a hundred million million individuals? A hundred million million individual souls that make you up, each with its own wants and desires and fears. What would what would each of them do? With the power of a thought and the power of will, you can command a hundred million million individuals and a hundred million million individual cells to do your bidding with absolute authority, whatever you, whatever you decide. With a thought, you can get up, go to the store, and will all these creatures, all these individuals, to buy a phone. Is that the best choice for the cells? <laughs> Is that what your cells would want 
if they had a democratic say in what we did. <laughs> I guess the point is here, what we, what we value and where we want to grow has a huge impact on uh, what our choices are and the path we take. To surmise, I hope the physics of growth and thinking from the perspective of a cell or a material and how it changes shape, how, how it deforms, how your shape compares to others, I hope this can help you to get you to where you want to go. And the four steps that I went over today, if you remember these, hopefully you can employ that for your own. Is first you need to measure yourself up, decide what you're good at, what your personality is like, what um, you'd like to grow into, and you have to compare yourself to the other shapes that are around you, compare yourself to the other people. And then after that comparison, you have a value to see what's their values, and what's my values of where I want to go, and then also in recognizing that these values were shaped in an environment, and in a context, and in, in a history where the, the values aren't abstract, but they're tangible. I think these tools will help you to make a accurate and tangible decision for what direction you want to grow in and where you'd like to go. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, you were talking about the cells when you were showing the whole human body and how all these things are all parts of a whole. Yeah. And it reminded me of a book that came out, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years ago called Resilience. And it was about the basis of knowledge. It's a question of things that we don't know that have just come through over time. And I'm wondering if that might have anything to do with it. Your question is how we know the things that we do know and where yeah, where that's come from. Yeah, and like, way back. I, I guess that, that links to the environment that we're all in and, and that, that affects the things that we value and the, the decision we make. And I definitely think that going back to your history, who, who your family is, where you come from, will help you to know who you are and what what you are and who other people are. I understand about measuring and comparing, um, but then you look at value, mm. and your your choice, your barriers are often not created by you, but outside world. Mm -hmm. So, how do you fit yourself into uh, a set of values if you don't exactly know what they are? Like so. for graduate school, mm -hmm. obviously you found uh, a val you understood your own value and you matched it <coughs> with the university mm -hmm. that accepted your values and accepted you. So there was growth. But how how would you do that if you did not know the values of the group that you want to join or the university or the society? Um, so the question is. Uh, you don't know the values of, of, the, of the person you're talking to, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the environment that, that, that you're in, and then how do you find out? Right. I, I, so you can direct your value right. elsewhere if you need to. I believe it would be through communication so that you understand where people are coming from, where you know, us connecting would mean I I would know where you're coming from. You know where I'm coming from. You get a you get a sense from people from different places um, that 
alleys that they've been living in. Good. So that, you know. So it, you might bomb out one place, but they may direct you to another place that mm -hmm. would be more acceptable to, to accepting your values. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, would you choose a place, experiment? Yes. Right. Uh, I th yeah, so I think the, my answer to if you would experiment, yes, but I, th uh, I think you can, you can always find your way wherever you are to find your way to, to find the value of, of where you can fit into, in, into the, where you are now. That doesn't mean you have to go somewhere else. Yeah. With your physics and math background, do you try to ex quantify this with equations or other models? Yeah, so for growth, there's uh, continuum mechanics where what inspired the, the personal the, the personal part of the story for me. So the, I guess the, the models is, is um, how a material, like a cell or, or like, rubber, how it sh stresses and changes as it deforms, as you apply stress to it. Those are the fundamental principles, but I'm applying those to, uh, in a loose sense, to personal growth. Does that answer? Sorry, the question was, was there a, was there a you physics model, or math? You model these, this behavior yeah. with equations of some kind. Mm. Yeah. Rubber is in an environment where you're okay. doing something to it, and in a similar way, you're in an environment where you're under pressures and stresses, and you're deforming and changing, and in that, that's that's connected to how, in principle, a, a material changes when you apply forces on it. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, seems to be like a, a, an analogy for what our, uh, like sort of a conscious analogy for what, I'm not going to get into consciousness here, but what would seem to be generally <laughs> accepted to be unconscious processes mm -hmm. uh, in the natural world. Um, so I guess uh, the thing I wanted to ask about was this process of deformation. Mm -hmm. Are you in a way saying that, that growth is a type of deformation? That's the analogy that I'm, that I'm trying. So the question was, if I'm saying that the growth is a kind of deformation, and that's the analogy that I'm making with the, the physics of continuum mechanics, which changes, someone said, it's, it's uh, external forces that are impinging on you that, that change you, that change your shape. That, I like that, the deforming idea. Yeah. Humble, like we need it. Yeah, so I have a question regarding, I mean, like, um, you know, the, the final slide measure compared value and growth. Mm. The question that I have in thinking is okay, you have gone through this cycle of measuring yourself, comparing, valuing, and growing. However, in life, sometimes things can happen, unpredictable yeah. things can happen. How would you? You know, put yourself in that, you know, like of shoes of, okay, this something just happened. How would you like, okay, process through all of that and then, you know, go through the cycle of measuring, comparing, valuing, and growing in terms of unpredictable events? Because anything can happen at any time, and you That's never know when. Yeah. Um, so the question is, when unpredictable things happen, uh, what, what can you do then? Yeah. Um, I don't know. They, they, they do happen. <laughs> you accept that. And that's the, the kind of, that is what it is in my, in my opinion. You, you, uh, you can't see everything. You can't see everything coming. So you, you I guess it, in my experience, you, you go with it. And that's the best you can do sometimes. You can still use this approach. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Josh? 
your uh, your conclusion reiterated, and I'm glad, the, the four steps on the right, measure, compare, value, and growth. This final slide is certainly complex. Do you use it, or have other people used it to try to bring growth into a mathematical framework? Yeah, precise, yeah exactly. Uh, this um, slide is taken from a group that uses a mathematical framework and a simulation to replicate cell growth and, and tissue growth and to model how leaves grow when we create their growth patterns and, and model things like that. So they, they go through s certain steps to recreate and and, re and model the growth of leaves and the, the growth of tissues and things like that. And there, there's, there are steps involved, like they divide the cell up numerically so that they can compute it efficiently they grow individual bits that's the that's the separation here they grow individual bits and stick them together and then after they're glued together they let it relax and and undergo deformation and then after that happens then you, the shape deforms into a stress-free configuration Um, yes. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Uh, uh, is the is this is this kind of model applied for medical science? Yeah, it's applied for like tissue modeling, tissue growth, like like um, human tissue. Because I, I believe they they want to um, be able to grow tissues in the future and apply that to um, new procedures, something like that. I don't know too in detail, but yeah. Josh, thank you. Thank you. Please join me for a final round of applause for our two speakers, Sophia Lee and Josh Chan.